Ooh, wow. Hey everyone, I just got dropped into this mystical land of YouTube by a tornado. Did you buy it? I am going to get right to it because I have a lot to get through. I watched, because I'm absolutely nuts, I guess, I watched every single version of The Wizard of Oz. It seemed like a good idea when I started. Um, and it's still a good idea. Don't get me wrong. I, there are some really interesting versions out there, as I discovered. But like I said, I watched them all. Oh, dedication. <laughs> so yes, I will get right to the list. Uh, first, uh, just the guidelines. The guidelines were, these all have to be versions of The Wizard of Oz. So adaptions, direct adaptions of the book or possibly of the 39 movie. There are a lot with references to that. No sequels, nothing like that. No completely original stories that just happen to be set in Oz. None of that. So you will not see Return to Oz, for example, any of those versions on this list. First up, let's go ahead and review the source material really quickly. My dog-eared copy of The Wonderful Wizard of Oz by L. Frank Baum that I have had since a child. It has the original pictures, which are by W. W. Denslow, but I had to look that up because they are not credited in this edition. Okay, The Wizard of Oz, Chapter 1. We are introduced to Dorothy, who lives on a farm in Kansas with her Uncle Henry and Aunt Em. Everything is depicted as gray and kind of lifeless. Her uncle and aunt work very hard and are very kind of dour as a result. Dorothy's little dog Toto is happy and loves to play, and it is this that keeps the little girl from turning as gray and dour as her aunt and uncle. They are having a typical day on the farm when a cyclone comes out of nowhere practically. Her uncle and aunt go for the storm cellar. Dorothy doesn't quite get there. The house is picked up by a cyclone. He almost falls through the trap door. Dorothy manages to catch him before that happens. And uh, they pass hours in this way, just kind of rocking about in the cyclone. And Dorothy actually gets tired and lays down on her bed. She finally falls asleep. Chapter 2, she winds up in a strange country, which is all colorful and beautiful. She is looking around when a little group of people comes toward her. They are about as tall as Dorothy, and they are definitely grown. Three are men, one is a woman. They are all oddly dressed, wearing round hats with little bells around the brims. Uh, the men wear blue hats, the woman wears a white hat. They greet Dorothy and thank her for killing the Witch of the East, and... Uh, think Dorothy is a witch. The woman explains that she is a good witch, the witch of the north, and there are four witches in the land of Oz. She also explains about Oz himself, the great wizard, and he lives in the city of Emeralds. They do go into the country a bit. The, uh, the south is the country of quadlings and the west is the country of winkies. The old lady says the north is her home but doesn't go into it much and the country is bordered by a great desert. The body of the witch has dried up so the witch of the north gives Dorothy the silver shoes. And the Witch of the North performs some odd magic, which, which involves her taking off her cap and balancing on its point on the end of her nose. Uh, she counts, and the cap changes into a slate, on which is written in chalk letters, Let Dorothy go to the city of Emeralds. They tell her to set off on the road of yellow brick. The witch gives Dorothy a kiss that will protect her, and then she turns around on her left heel three times and disappears, but Dorothy knows she's a witch and expected her to disappear that way, so she's not surprised. Dorothy goes back into her little house, picks out some food, puts it in her basket, and takes it on her way for the journey. She also changes her clothes into a dress, not a pinafore, a dress of gingham with blue and white checks, and puts a pink sunbonnet on her head. And then as she travels along further, she finds a scarecrow on a pole. It is dressed as a munchkin farmer. It talks to her, so she talks back. They have a nice conversation, etc. She tells him she's going to see Oz. He says, can Oz give me some brain? She says, I don't know. You want to come out around and find out? 
Chapter 4, the Scarecrow and Dorothy walk along, and he tells her a bit about how he came to be. Uh, he says he was only made the day before yesterday, so he's practically born yesterday. Uh, he says, luckily, when the farmer made my head, one of the first things he did was to paint my ears so that I heard what was going on. Then his eyes, so he could see what was going on. He thought at first he was a man like the others, but then he realized, no. He was set up on the pole to scare the crows. Of course, the crows weren't scared of him at all. The crows tell him that perhaps if he had some brains, he would be a better scarecrow. And this is what leads him to want to see Oz. Chapter 5. They walk along further and come across a tin man, kind of frozen by the side of the road. He is able to talk to them, but that's about it. He directs them to find his oil can and oil his joints. They do so and they continue on their journey. The Tin Woodman tells them his story, which is kind of gruesome. He used to be a man like any other, and he fell in love with a munchkin girl. However, the girl lived with an old woman who did not want her to marry anyone. She wanted the girl to stay with her and keep house. So the woman went to the Wicked Witch of the East and made a bargain that she would prevent the marriage. The Wicked Witch enchanted his axe, and while the woman was chopping wood in the forest, the axe slipped, and started chopping off his body parts. <laughs> Can't make this stuff up. First, he chopped off his leg, so he went to the tinsmith, and the tinsmith made him a leg out of tin, then his other leg, and so on and so forth. However, uh, since he became totally tin, he now had no heart and had lost all his love for the munchkin girl. So now he has resolved to go to Oz and ask him for a heart so that he can find the girl and finally ask her to marry him. In the next chapter, they keep going along and encounter the lion, who is cowardly as ever and asks to go along with them. Much is made of the Tin Woodman being very tender-hearted, <laughs> right? Yeah. Uh, he will not even step on a bug. He will go around it if it crosses his path. And this is interesting given what comes later. Stay tuned. They continue on their journey. The yellow brick road runs off into a giant chasm and they cannot get across. So the lion takes them in turn on his back. Then they come into a part of the forest which is thicker and the lion whispers to them that it is in this part of the country that the Kaleidas live. They are monstrous beasts with bodies like bears and heads like tigers and claws so long and sharp that they can tear you in two. Then they come to another gulf across the road and this one is too big for the lion. The scarecrow says why don't you fell a tree and then we can walk along it. As they start to cross the Kaleidas come upon them them, and the lion turns to face them and gives so loud a terrible roar that even the fierce beasts stop short and look at him in surprise. But then they remember that they are bigger than the lion and continue on their way. The friends cross in a big hurry, and the scarecrow directs the tin man to chop the tree down. And the two Kaleidas are nearly across. The tree fell with a crash into the gulf, carrying the ugly, snarling brutes with it, and both were dashed to pieces on the sharp rocks at the bottom. Holy cats. Next, the road runs off into a broad river, so the Tin Woodman cuts a few logs and makes them a raft. They pull along on the raft, but after a while, the water gets so deep that the poles will not touch the bottom, and they are not sure what to do. The Scarecrow pushes ever harder on his pole, and it sticks fast in the mud. Before he can pull it out again, the raft is swept away, and the Scarecrow is left clinging to the pole. The other friends float down the river, and the lion decides that he can swim to shore and pull the raft after him if they hold to his tail. This works. They walk back along the river, find the Scarecrow, but they can't get to him. So a stork flies by, and they ask him politely if they can fly the Scarecrow back, which he does. They next come across a field of poppies, and it proves that the scent of the poppies is too strong. So Dorothy and the lion fall asleep. The lion manages to arouse himself and bounds forward a bit, so he's out of sight. The other two decide to pick up Dorothy and Toto and carry them along. They are able to get them out, but they come across the lion who has fallen asleep again, and they cannot get him out. So what are they going to do? Check. As they are deciding what to do, they see a mouse run by, and in pursuit of it is a mean old wild cat. So, ha <laughs> ha. The Tin Woodman saw that running before the beast was a little gray field mouse, and although he had no heart, he knew it was wrong for the wildcat to try to kill such a pretty harmless creature. So he cuts off the wildcat's head. Wow. The field mouse is thankful for this, and it turns out it is the queen of all field mice, and it asks what it can do to repay them. So what happens is the Tin Woodman 
cuts down some more trees, makes a sort of rollable truck thing, and the mice bring bits of string, which they fasten to the truck. It's a lot of hard work, but they manage to get the line onto the truck, and then they pull him along out of the field of poppies. They say, if you ever need us again, come into the field and call. We shall hear you and come to your assistance. I presume the mice were small enough, like they're under the poppy, so they weren't affected by the scent. When they get to the Emerald City, the guardian of the gates tells them that they must wear spectacles, which he takes out of a large green locked box. He says, if you did not wear spectacles, the brightness and glory of the Emerald City would blind you. Even those who live in the cities must wear spectacles night and day. So they all get spectacles, even little Toto, and they're locked on with a key. Next chapter... Even with their eyes protected, they are dazzled by the brilliancy of the wonderful city. Everyone in the city seems to have greenish skins and clothes and everything. It's crazy. They go to the palace where they are admitted and um, are told they must remain there for several days. So they ha are shown to comfortable rooms. Dorothy gets a change of clothes. Green brocaded satin with a green silk apron and she ties a green ribbon around Toto's neck. Oh. He will see Dorothy and her friends because the guard mentioned that she had the silver shoes and he was very much interested. So Dorothy goes into the throne room first and encounters an enormous head just sitting there all by itself. It questions her about some things and tells her that, okay, I can help you out, but you gotta kill the Wicked Witch of the West. And she's like, oh, geez, I can't do that. I'm just a little girl. So she doesn't know what to do. The next morning, it's the scarecrow's turn. He goes in and sees a lovely lady all dressed in green and she has wings. She tells him pretty much the same thing. The next morning, the Tin Woodman's turn and he sees a terrible beast, nearly as big as an elephant, a head of a rhinoceros, only there were five eyes in its face, five long arms growing out of its body, five long slim legs and thick woolly hair covering every part it. Wow. However, this beast tells him the same thing. Next morning, the lions turn, and what he sees is a ball of fire that he almost can't bear to see it. Again, same thing. So all the friends are kind of worried because they don't think they can kill anyone, except maybe Kaleidos, I guess. Uh, but they decide to go anyway because what choice do they have? So they head along the road towards the country of the Winkies, which is ruled by the Wicked Witch. Now, the Wicked Witch of the West has one eye, but that is as powerful as a telescope, and she can see everywhere. So, she happens to look around and sees Dorothy lying asleep with her friends all about her. She's angry to find them in her country, and she blows upon a silver whistle that hangs around her neck. At once, there comes running to her from all directions a pack of great wolves. She says, go and tear them to pieces. They're like, aren't you going to make them your slaves? You do that with everybody else. She says, nah, none of them is really fit to work. So they dash off. The Scarecrow and the Woodman are wide awake and they hear the wolves coming. The Woodman says, this is my fight, so get behind me and I will meet them as they come. He seizes his axe, which he has made very sharp. And as the leader of the wolves comes on, the Tin Woodsman, I quote, swung his arm and chopped the wolf's head from his body so that it immediately died. As soon as he could raise his axe, another wolf came up and he also fell under the sharp edge of the Tin Woodsman's weapon. There were 40 wolves and 40 times a wolf was killed so that at last they all lay dead in a heap before the woodman. Then he put down the axe and sat beside the scarecrow who said, it was a good fight, friend. I mean, you know, what's a kid's story without buckets of blood, right? So the Wicked Witch is not happy about this eventuality, so she blows her silver whistle twice. On comes a flock of wild crows. She tells them, fly to the strangers, peck out their eyes, and tear them to pieces. The Scarecrow says, this is my battle, lie down beside me and you will not be harmed. So he stands up and stretches out his arms. When the crows saw him, they were frightened. But the King Crow said, it is only a stuffed man, I will peck his eyes out. So he flies at the scarecrow, who catches it by the head and twists its neck until it is dead. Then another crow flies at him. There are 40 crows, 40 times, until at last they're all lying dead. Whew. So they keep going. The Wicked Witch looks out again and gets mad, blows her whistle three times. Now it's time for a swarm of black bees. She says, go to the strangers and sting them to death. But the woodman had seen them coming. The scarecrow decided what to do. He says, take out my straw and scatter it over the girl, the dog, and the lion so the bees cannot sting them. So the bees came and found no one but the woodman to sting. So they flew at him and broke off all their stings against the tin without hurting the woodman at all. And as bees cannot live when their stings are broken, that was the end of the black bees. And they lay scattered thick about the woodman like little heaps of fine coal. Ah! 
Though the Wicked Witch was so angry, she stamped her foot and tore her hair and gnashed her teeth. Then she called a dozen of her slaves and gave them sharp spears. They're not a brave people, but they had to do as they were told. So they marched until they came near, then the lion gave a great roar and sprang toward them, and they ran back as fast as they could. The Wicked Witch beat them and sent them back to their work and tried to figure out what to do next. There was in her cupboard a golden cap with a circle of diamonds and rubies running around it. It had a charm. Whoever owned it could call three times upon the winged monkeys who would obey any order they were given. But no person could command these strange creatures more than three times. Twice already she had used the charm. Once was when she had made the winkies her slaves. The second time was when she had fought against the great Oz himself. So we got some backstory here. But she figures there's nothing else I can do. I gotta use this one more time. So she stands on her left foot, says some magic words, stands on her right foot, says some more magic words, and then she stands upon both feet and says some more magic words. All the magic words sound kind of ridiculous, so that's probably why they're not in any adaptions. The monkeys go to where the friends are walking. They seize the tin woodman, carry him through the air, and drop him on some sharp rocks so he cannot move. They catch the scarecrow and pull all his straw out. They throw pieces of rope around the lion and uh, lift him up and carry him to the castle. Dorothy they don't harm at all because she has the good witch's kiss on her forehead. They simply carry her to the castle gently and leave her there. Then they tell the witch, your power over us is ended and you will never see us again. The witch herself is not too happy when she sees the mark on Dorothy's forehead because she knows that she doesn't dare hurt the little girl either. She also sees the silver shoes and she's like, oh boy, those are powerful. Then she realizes that Dorothy's just an innocent little girl and has no idea of the power of the shoes. So she's like, mm, I can make her my slave anyway, just by telling her she has no power. And that's precisely what she does. She sets Dorothy to work. Then she imprisons the lion since she can't make him work. Now, of course, the witch can't harm Dorothy. Once, the witch struck Toto a blow with her umbrella, and the brave little dog flew at her and bit her leg in return. The witch did not bleed where she was bitten, for she was so wicked that the blood in her had dried up many years before. So things go on this way for a little bit, and it is also revealed that the witch has a fear of water. So she never goes near when Dorothy is taking her bath, even though that is a prime opportunity for her to take the shoes. She finally thinks of a trick. She places a bar of iron in the middle of the kitchen floor and makes it invisible. So Dorothy walks across, stumbles over the bar, and isn't much hurt, but one of her silver shoes comes off, and the witch snatches it away. The little girl is angry at this, and says, you have no right to take my shoe from me, and the witch just laughs at her. This makes Dorothy so angry that she just picks up a bucket of water that stands near her and dashes it over the witch. The woman begins to shrink and fall away. The witch's last words are, Well, in a few minutes I shall be all melted, and you will have the castle to yourself. I have been wicked in my day, but I never thought a little girl like you would be able to melt me and end my wicked deeds. Look out! Here I go! It's not quite as uh, impressive as, um, what world is it? The witch falls down into a brown, melted, shapeless mass and begins to spread over the clean boards of the kitchen floor. Oh, God. Dorothy has to clean it all up. Then she tells everybody, yay, you're not prisoners anymore. So the Winkies go and help to fix up the Tin Woodman and the Scarecrow. And that takes a little bit of time. They decide to go back to Oz now that the witch is gone and they are all free. Dorothy finds the golden cap. And she's like, oh, what a pretty cap. So she takes it. In the next chapter, they go back home. There is no road between the Emerald City and the Wicked Witch's castle because, I mean, <laughs> who would want to go there, of course? But they find their way back all right, initially. But it is slow going. Dorothy suggests maybe we could fall, call the field mice. Maybe they can tell us the way. So the queen arrives and she says, why don't you use the charm of the cap and call the winged monkeys? So Dorothy's surprised at that. It, the charm is written inside the cap. So Dorothy follows the directions. The winged monkeys come and pick them up and carry them to the Emerald City. On the way, the king of the monkeys tell them how they came to be. He says, at one point, we were just happy monkeys living in the forest. There was a beautiful princess in the north who was a sorceress. All her magic was used to help people, and she was a good person. She found a man who she decided to marry, and they were in love. Now, the current leader of the Winged Monkeys, his granddaddy, uh, lived in the forest near the palace, and he loved a good joke. While he was walking along, he sees this guy walking along the river. So he calls his band, they pick him up, and drop him in the river. 
The guy just laughs. He's like, it's shallow here. My clothes weren't too ruined. It's all a good joke. But when the princess arrives, she is not too happy. So she calls all the winged monkeys to be brought before her and decides to punish them. So she takes the cap, which was a wedding present for them, and decides to put a charm on it and makes the monkeys slaves. Chapter 15, our friends get back to the Emerald City. They say goodbye to the winged monkeys. They go up to the gates, get the spectacles, and are brought to the palace. There they wait around for days and days and get finally get mad that they're being put off. The Scarecrow sends word that if they get put off any longer, they're going to call the winged monkeys to help them. And this freaks the wizard out, so he finally agrees to see them. They enter the throne room and see nobody there. Finally, they hear a voice that seems to come from everywhere all at once. They tell him they've destroyed the witch and that he must keep his promise. And he says, oh, dear, dear, oh, my, my, my. Well, isn't that wonderful? But I must have time to think it over. And they said, you've had plenty of time already. Come on. The lion thinks maybe he should frighten the wizard into granting their request. So he gives a large, loud roar, which is so fierce and dreadful that Toto jumps and tips over a screen, which stands in the corner. Behind it, they see a little old man with a bald head and a wrinkled face, who seems to be just as much surprised as they are. The Tin Woodman, who is all heart, immediately raises his axe and rushes toward the little man and cries out, Who are you? He says, I am Oz, the great and terrible, but don't strike me. Please don't, and I'll do anything you want me to. Oz tells them he's nothing but a humbug, and he leads them into the other room and shows them his tricks for making himself look other than he is. For example, the head is made out of paper mache and was hung by a wire from the ceiling. He wore a dress and mask to be the lovely lady. That must have been a heck of a mask. The ball of fire was a ball of cotton, which had oil poured upon it. He tells them he was a performer in Omaha, went up in a balloon, and then couldn't come down again. The winds blew him to Oz, and the people, seeing him come from the clouds, thought he was a great wizard. So, of course, he let them think so, because why not? He says, just to amuse myself and to keep them busy, I ordered them to build the city and my palace. Then, he thought as the country was so green and beautiful, he would call it the Emerald City. And to make the name fit better, he put green spectacles on all the people so that everything they saw was green. Because it isn't really green, it's all humbug. He says one of his greatest fears was the witches, because he has no magical powers at all. Fortunately, the witches of the North and South were good and would do him no harm, but the witches of the East and West were wicked. And had they not thought he was more powerful, they would have destroyed him. So he lived in deadly fear of them, and he was very pleased when he heard that the Wicked Witch of the East had been destroyed. So when they came to him, he was willing to promise anything to get rid of the other witch. But he says he is very ashamed he cannot keep his promises to them. However, because he is really a good man, he wants to think of some way that he can try to keep his promises to them. So he says, come back tomorrow, and I really will try and help you. And that's exactly what he does. The scarecrow goes in to see him. The wizard unfastens his head and empties out the straw. Then he takes a measure of bran, having mixed it with a great many pins and needles, and puts this into the scarecrow's head and puts the head back on his body. He says, hereafter you will be a great man, for I have given you a lot of bran new brains. Next, the Tin Woodman goes to see him. The man cuts a hole in his chest with a pair of tinner shears. Then he goes and takes a heart made of silk and stuffed with sawdust, places it in the chest, and solders it back together. In goes the lion. The little man takes a square green bottle, the contents of which he pours into a dish. He explains that this is liquid courage, and the lion drinks it down. Chapter 17. Dorothy has to wait a few more days, and she's getting worrieder and worrieder. On the fourth day, Oz sends for her and says, I think I found a way. I think I'm going to make a balloon, and it will float us both out of here. After all, I've been away for a long time, and it gets kind of tiresome just being shut up in a palace all day. I think I'd rather go back to Kansas and be in a circus again. So that's exactly what he does. They have the balloon carried out in front of the palace. It's a big to-do. The tin woodman chops a big pile of wood, makes a fire of it. The hot air rises, etc. Oz gets in and tells the people that the scarecrow will rule over them from then on. Dorothy, however, cannot find Toto. Toto had run into the crowd to bark at a kitten. She finally finds him, runs toward the balloon, and 
She was within a few steps of it when crack went the ropes and the balloon rises into the air without her. Of course, he can't come back, and that was the last any of them ever saw of Oz the Wonderful Wizard, though he may have reached Omaha safely and be there now, for all we know. Chapter 18 the friends meet and talk matters over. Dorothy is very despondent. She loves her friend, she loves the place, but she wants to go home. The Scarecrow thinks about it and says, why not call the winged monkeys and ask if they can carry you over the desert? So Dorothy goes for the golden cap and calls the monkey king. Unfortunately, he says he cannot leave the country. None of them can go to Kansas because they don't belong there. They call in the head guard of the palace, the soldier with the green whiskers who shows up in many other books. He says he's not sure either, but Glinda might know. So if they journey to find her, she might have an answer. So out they head to the country of the Quadlings. And this is where they get attacked by trees. No matter what they do, the trees grab at them with their long branches and toss them about. They can't seem to get through until the woodman takes his axe and chops off their branches, i.e. their arms. Then they come to a high wall, which is made of china. So the Tin Woodman makes a ladder and they climb over. They find themselves in a dainty china country. There are so many houses made entirely of china and painted in the brightest colors. All the little animals, everything, all the people are made of china. And of course, it being a magical country, they are all alive. They come upon a little china princess. Dorothy says, can't you let me carry you back to Kansas and stand you on my mantel shelf? And the princess says, that would make me very unhappy because when we get taken away from our country, our joints stiffen and we can only stand straight and look pretty. They come to the end of the country, have to go over the china wall. It's not as high as the first and the lion manages to jump over it. However, in so doing, he upsets a china church with his tail. So it's best they're out of that place. After that, they find themselves back in the forest. The wild animals of that forest come to them and say, hey, we're being set upon by a giant spider. Can you do something about it? And Lion's like, well, okay, I can try. So he goes after the spider, does battle, and wins. And the lion is now the king of the forest. Finally, chapter 22, we get to the country of the quadlings. They get to a steep hill and cannot get over it because there are great pieces of rock. They go to try, and the denizens that live on the hill attack them. They are very short, stout people who are basically hammerheads. Their heads can shoot out from their bodies. Not They're still on their necks, but their necks are extremely long, and they can just hit people with their heads. So Dorothy calls the winged monkeys one last time to carry them over the hill. After a little more traveling, they make it to Glinda's palace. They meet her. Glinda is a redhead, by the way, just as she is in the movie, so that is accurate. But her dress is white. So anyway, my goodness, this has taken a lot longer to get through this book than I thought, so let's wrap it up. Glinda tells Dorothy that she can get her back to Kansas, but she asks in return that Dorothy give her the golden cap. Dorothy has no more use for it, so of course. Glinda calls on the monkeys and asks them to take the lion to the forest, the tin woodman to the country of the Winkies, and the scarecrow back to the Emerald City so they may rule their respective domains. Then she tells Dorothy that she always had the power to go home because her silver shoes would carry her over the desert, but of course then she wouldn't have been able to help her friends, so Dorothy considers it to have been worth it. Dorothy says goodbye to her friends, and then she clicks her heels together three times and says, Take me home to Aunt M. She and Toto whirl through the air. The silver shoes take but three steps. And then she stopped so suddenly that she rolled over upon the grass several times before she knew where she was. She sits up, looks around, and just before her is the new farmhouse Uncle Henry built after the cyclone carried away the old one. Toto jumps out of her arms and runs toward the farm, and Dorothy runs after him and up to her Aunt Em to give her a big hug. The end. The very first version, 1910, silent, uh, obviously. This one jumps right into the action with a donkey terrorizing the farmhands, Uncle Henry and Aunt Em. Uh, Dorothy then meets the Scarecrow, who is already an animate being in the real world, uh, with the donkey and cow as onlookers. 
The Scarecrow tries to help Dorothy shelter in a haystack against the oncoming cyclone. And there's a moment that made me go, what is that donkey doing? It was disturbing looking. So anywho, the tornado takes them to the Land of Oz, which looks very jungly. Mamba the Witch, don't ask me who that is, has a really cool entrance. There's lots of wire work in this. She has power over the wizard and makes him keep on being king, although he just wants to go home to Omaha. Glinda the Good changes Toto, who I don't think was in this until now, into a giant doggy who cuffs the oncoming lion. They shake paws and agree to be friends. Dorothy, the Scarecrow, and multitudinous animals find and rescue the Tin Woodman. All rejoice in a party-slash-dance interlude, and again I'm going, what is that donkey doing? Seriously, watch this one. They venture past Mama's cottage, and Mama and her guards attack for whatever reason. Dorothy is taken prisoner, and instantly thinks to throw water on Mamba, who crossfades away. Her friends enter, and they proceed to ransack the place. Dorothy finds a certificate stating that the wizard, yes indeed, does very much want to give up his throne. They proceed to the Emerald City, stating they are there to claim the crown and are somehow welcomed in with open arms. The wizard gives up the throne to the Scarecrow. There is a brief dance interlude. The dancer's costumes are reminiscent of the Ginger's Army uniforms in the Land of Oz from the illustrations, and that's a nice touch. The wizard leaves in his balloon, and that's that. Nobody gives a thought to how Dorothy is going to get home. The Wizard of Oz, the 1925 version, also obviously silent. This one is a little more uh, well-known. This is the Larry Simon, Simon version. It begins in a way that's reminiscent of like a Nutcracker retelling. It's got a toy maker making dolls of the main Oz characters. A little girl enters with the book, and he sits down to tell her the story. The story itself opens years after the Princess of Oz has disappeared. The Prime Minister Cruel, K-R-U-E-L, reigns, aided by Lady Vicious, V-I-S-H-U-S-S, -S, and Ambassador Wicked, W-I-K-K-E-D. I guess all those are, you know, for the people who thought the name Victor Von Doom wasn't enough on the nose. Uh, luckily for the people, Prince Kind, K-Y-N-D, is still around. Uh, the people are getting restless, so the Prime Minister brings in his wizard to perform some sideshow magic and distract them. He makes an automaton appear to dance for them, so I guess this really is the Nutcracker? Well, the little girl doesn't like the retelling, so she complains, and we pick up instead with a rather grown-up Dorothy on her farm with a very familiar Aunt Em and blustery Uncle Henry. There's a lot of slapstick involving the farmhands, and oh boy. Here we go. 1925, white people movie. Uh, one of the farmhands is Black, who we meet in a brief scene <laughs> involving eating watermelon. Ah. Anyway, so the farmhands, a duck, a lollipop, an unnaturally high swing, and a huge cactus in Kansas? We learn that Dorothy was left on the Gale's doorstep as a baby. Meanwhile in Oz, the people demand to know where their princess is. Kind gives Cruel limited time to produce her, or he'll remove Cruel from the throne, because he hasn't so far, because I guess Cruel is doing an awesome job? I don't know. Cruel sends Wicked with henchmen to Kansas via biplane uh, to retrieve the papers proving Dorothy's heritage. There is a lot of rigmarole involving Dorothy needing to get rescued, more slapstick, and uh, the movie's over halfway through before we finally get to the tornado. This blows Dorothy, three farmhands, Wicked, and also her Uncle Henry, to Oz. They land right at the gates of the city and are greeted by Prince Kind. Dorothy opens her papers, proving that she is the princess. Cruel orders the wizard to change the farmhands into something for no apparent reason. The wizard being a fake can't, but he tells the farmhands they'll have to fake it to save his bacon. Again, what's in this for them? But they do it anyway. They run from the guards, one into a cornfield behind a scarecrow, another into a junk pile. They disguise themselves as the scarecrow and tin man, but possibly they do this too well because Cruel freaks out and orders their arrest anyway. Two of the farmhands get thrown into a dungeon, but one leaks himself with Cruel and becomes a knight. That would be the Tin Man. There are lions in the dungeon. The wizard helps to scare away the guards by dressing ha, Snowball, which is the name of the black farmhand. Ha ha ha. He dresses him up as a less than convincing lion. 
The scarecrow then escapes up a very tall ladder and tells Dorothy, he warns her not to trust anyone. He then gets chased after, and he ends up in the lion's den. There is an overly long slapstick sequence. Cruel Max on Dorothy in an effort to marry her and regain his power. Kind catches him, and they have a sword duel. The wizard helps the scarecrow escape the dungeon, and he assists Kind in winning the duel. Also, he straight up kills a guard. Cruel explains that it was he who brought Dorothy to Kansas in the first place to save her, but he still gets led away by the guard. The knight slash woodman sees the scarecrow and gives chase. This leads them outside and to the top of a tower. The scarecrow gets rescued by the lion in a biplane, but he falls out, whereupon the toy maker's doll topples over. The toy maker has forgotten the rest of his story, and the little girl takes her toys and leaves. <clears throat> so, interesting facts. Oliver Hardy is in this. He plays the tin man slash farmhand. And Spencer Bell plays the lion slash farmhand. This is black actor Spencer Bell's sixth time playing someone named Snowball. The first animated version from 1933. There's not a lot to say about this one because it is very short. Um, basically, just Dorothy and her friends gallivanting about in Oz, but it doesn't adhere to the story very closely. It's directed by Max Fleischer, and it's just very much cute little cartoon jokes and slapstick bits of the time. So it's, it's worth a watch, um, just for historical purposes, if nothing else. 1939, this is such a little-known adaption. I'm sure barely anybody's ever seen it. Okay, okay, it's Judy Garland, Ray Bolger, Burt Lahr, Jack Haley, Frank Morgan, Margaret Hamilton, etc., 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 etc. Oh my gosh, and Toto 2. I was pretty much raised on this movie. My dad is a big fan, so ask me anything. I just, I, I know this movie so well. I'm sure many other people do, too. It's one of those that you can watch over and over again, and it's, it's hard to get tired of it. It's a well-made movie, and the songs are still catchy. A lot of it still holds up. There's just so much trivia out there about this film, and it just gets interestinger and interestinger. Like many people know about Buddy Ebsen being the original Tin Man, he was one of the bigger actors at this time, uh, Ray Bolger, Jack Haley, and Burt Lahr were not super well known, uh, nor were they necessarily well known afterwards. Ray Bolger did have his own TV show um, in the early 50s. And of course, one of the original ideas for Dorothy was Shirley Temple, as she was a little girl and very popular at the time. So yes, lots of trivia, but the one thing I have never seen let me know if you have the answer, because I have not found this anywhere. Okay, Frank Morgan as the wizard, the guard, etc. He's got like, I don't know, six different parts in the movie. When they go to visit the wizard initially, and they encounter a giant floating head. Who plays the giant floating head? Because that ain't Frank Morgan. If you know, let me know in the comments. Haha, <laughs> here we go. I have seen this one before, and it didn't get any better on a repeated viewing. The Wizard of Mars, 1965. Huh. Okay. So, the first title screen is Horrors of the Red Planet. I don't know if they renamed it later, or if the version I watched is missing the first title card. It does boast... Electron Effects by Frank A. Coe. Frank has IMDb credits for music and sound on such unforgettable gems as Up Yours, Hell's Chosen Few, and The Lemon Grove Kids Meet the Monsters. The movie itself takes place circa January 1st, 1975, according to a gauge on the ship, so it's a futuristic movie. Four astronauts are doing important things on their ship en route to the Red Planet. The crew consists, in classic 50s, 60s American fashion, of a white, young, but not too young leader type person, a white, middle aged expert type person, a white, young, comedic sidekick type person who honestly is the only one who really seems to be trying to act. So, you know, bless his little heart. And a white, gorgeous lady type person who is really good at screaming when necessary. Her character name is Dorothy, and she's also really poorly dubbed. Although the ship encounters severe storms close by, including He-Man-style animated lightning, as it nears the planet, nobody seems particularly perturbed. 
Their oxygen is low, but their leader comes up with a highly scientific idea to boost their oxygen from that in the Martian atmosphere, so they set off to explore. Soon enough, they have to deploy their rafts to explore the river, made of water, that they have on Mars. After getting attacked by the Martian River Muppets, they row along into a cavern. They, quote, wander for what seems like days, unquote. It seems like that from the audience, too. There is a lot of walking in this movie. At last, they come to a larger volcanic cavern past a waterfall of lava, which, you know, also exists on Mars. After more wandering about in the desert this time, they come across a path made of what appears to be brick. Not yellow brick, golden brick, but still it's a bit odd being Mars and all. In the very next shot, they've come upon a crumbling castle. It is not green in the least and appears man-made or alien-made, but it's amazing how many alien structures tend to have something in common with human ones. There's still a bit of walking to get to the castle or sliding down a gravel hill, then walking where they've come to the end of the road, which is code for we didn't have the budget to build an actual road. Finally, they encounter a Martian. It is humanoid, with suspiciously glassy eyes that don't blink. His brain, however, does. The leader gets up close, and there's a loud whispering. His eyes roll back in his head, and he rocks back and forth. And all those, all of this goes on for at least two minutes before anyone asks if he's okay. He states that he is. It's like the thing was trying to share his mind. You know, nothing to worry about there. They are guided into another dark room with what appears to be a huge blinky brain all on its own. It pops up an avatar that looks like John Carradine. The whispers change into what is clearly backwards talking, but our super genius astronauts don't understand the language. So the rest of the movie is John Carradine's floaty, but not blinky, head explaining what happened to the civilization that used to be there. It's kind of confusing. They've been plucked out of time? And now our humans have to help the Martians by replacing a sphere into a mechanism which will fix everything. So our uh, heroes find the sphere hidden completely out in the open in the next room over. They pick it up and promptly drop it. Fortunately, it's only the outer casing of the sphere that's cracked, so everything's okay. They then break open the sealed room they found earlier and find the mechanism, which is actually kind of cool looking. They place the sphere in there in, and the pendulum of the mechanism it, clock, it's a clock, it starts to swing. The castle then starts to crumble. The astronauts run outside without bothering to put their spacesuits back on, collapse on the brick road, and disappear. They end up back on their spaceship, fully intact, speeding through space around the time they last contacted Earth. And I guess, a uh, good lesson was learned by all, and there was completely a point to that. Okay, 1971, a Turkish version entitled this. Okay, this uh, version, the, the pictures I'm putting up are not going to be very good because this has, nobody's bothered to remaster this one. It also has no subtitles. How will I ever follow the plot this one actually starts out promising enough. It's very similar to the book with Dorothy on the farm with her aunt and uncle, even a dog. It inexplicably shifts to animation during the tornado scene over credits. Uh, I'm guessing they didn't have a budget for a tornado. The animation though is so bad it makes filmation look Oscar worthy. There's a sudden shift back to live action with an instant cut to Dorothy frolicking with what we can presume are Glinda and the Munchkins. The music is so weird. I kind of dig it. Dorothy sets off to explore this new land and comes upon a scarecrow in a field. There is dancing and songs. None of them are all memorable. And seem like folk songs and dances, I don't think Arlen and Harburg have anything to worry about. They find the Tin Man and more dancing ensues. I have the feeling that's going to happen a lot. The Munchkins must work for Glinda, I'm guessing. They keep abruptly appearing, ostensibly to check on Dorothy's progress and then disappearing. The evil trees coming to life and their branch-like arms threatening is pretty cheesy, but the arms themselves look pretty good, like as if they're actually part of the tree. I mean, I will give this movie any <laughs> props that I can, you know, to be fair. They come upon a wall and use a handy ladder to climb it. On the other side is a village populated by frozen children. And oh my gosh... I think it's supposed to be the China Village. Ah! 
Next, they come to a wide lake and use a raft to cross it. They get stuck. The munchkins appear and use their magic to transport them back to land. Next, they make a tea party appear, which is a cue for another dance routine. The friends are soon, though not soon enough, on their way and encounter the darlingest construction paper-looking castle you will ever see. The friends are ushered into a large room containing a small altar, a flame, and a skull. And what the frick is going on? Only now are we introduced to the Wicked Witch, who I must say decorates very well on a sparse budget. She watches them with her spyglass, and the woodman covers his friends with the scarecrow's straw. Like, are they doing the part with the bees? There aren't any bees to be seen. And Oh my gosh, oh my gosh, okay, the witch's soldiers come after them next, but they won't touch Dorothy because she has the mark from Glinda's kiss, just like in the book. The witch imprisons Dorothy. The munchkins appear, but apparently can't magic her out. She also locks up the lion and teases him in a scene that looks for all the world like foreplay. Uh, Dorothy is out um, of her cell, but trips and loses her shoe, which the witch picks up in delight. Are these the silver slippers? Because we missed a lot of plot in the beginning. Uh, so, a quick bouquet of water and bam, no more witch. The guards thank Dorothy, the lion, and the munchkins. Where were the tin man and the scarecrow this whole time? Cue a victory dance! They present their case to the wizard's skull, whereupon the real fake wizard is unmasked by Toto. But the wizard really looks like a wizard? Pointy hat and everything? The wizard goes to take Dorothy back to Kansas, but the balloon takes off early to the tune of a hot time in the old town tonight. I am not making this up. The scarecrow is now King of Oz, but he can't send Dorothy back. The munchkins appear and, I'm guessing, explain that everything can be solved with a random folk dance. So it's back to the China Village to do just that, to the tunes of the sidewalks of New York and various other American folk tunes. Next, our friends encounter cave people. Why not? Who do interpretive dance? The munchkins appear and smite them with one cannon shot. More folk dancing. Oh, here's Glenda, about darn time. Dorothy clicks her heels together and instantly returns to Kansas. The munchkins also appear there to see her off. They have such power over time and space. Never cross the Turkish munchkins. 20th Century Oz, an Australian version from 1976. Note of interest, this has New Zealand actor Bruce Spence, whose name you might not recognize, but when you see him, you might go, oh, yeah, that guy. So, teenage slash early 20-something Dorothy is feeling dragged down by her small town, but she stays to help her aunt and uncle. After enjoying the concert of a local band, Dorothy accepts a ride in their van. An accident leaves her unconscious and dreaming about a journey through the outback. First stop is a shop called Good Fairy. The proprietor known as Glynn informs her that her van has struck down a pedestrian, a quote-unquote dreadful person, and offers her anything in the shop she wishes as a reward, which turns out to be a pair of red sequined heels. A tough enters to inform her that the dead person is, is his brother and swears revenge. Dorothy is entranced by a poster in the shop of a musician called The Wizard, who has one last performance that evening in the city. Dorothy must follow the highway to get there. The Scarecrow is our Bruce Spence, band member one. Here he's a beach bum stuck by the side of the road with tire trouble. Dorothy shows him how a jack works, and they are soon on their way. They stop at a roadside cafe for a bite. The tough has followed them and threatens Dorothy again. Then it's on to a service station for gas. The Tin Man is band number two, a mechanic who messes with the car, purely in order to give Dorothy a ride himself. While waiting for him, a motorcyclist arrives, a.k.a. the Cowardly Lion, and band member three. The tough arrives in his truck, and Dorothy and the Tin Man drive off in his car. After the Tin Man 2 experiences car trouble, Dorothy resumes walking rather than wait and gets picked up by the lion with his motorcycle. This is kind of cute. The lion's motorcycle has rainbow detailing, and he belongs to a gang called the Lions. They get to a beach where they stop for a rest, and the other two catch up with them. Dorothy falls asleep on the sand, and uh, the shop owner, Glynn, who happens to stop by, wakens her. He offers her a ride. The other three set off after them. She gets dropped off in the city, goes to a record store which has just closed, and asks for a ticket to the concert. At first, the clerk says no, then relents and tells her to meet him at the theater. 
She boards a trolley. The trolley worker is the same guy. I kind of got confused by this part. She spends a lot of time wandering around the city, which must have been gorilla shot because a lot of the extras look straight at the cameras with mild curiosity. When she gets to the theater, the usher, again the same guy, refuses to let her in until she promises to meet him after the show which actually she never does. Then the other three guys show up to meet her. They talk their way backstage. The concert itself is really something. The wizard is a thong-clad David Bowie wannabe mixed with Rainbow Bright. He sings one song, does some seriously disturbing dance moves assisted by video effects, and kind of chills out for the rest of the song. The crowd loves it, though. After the concert, Dorothy is accosted in the street by some toughs who beat up her friends and drag her to the truck of the head tough who kidnaps her. He takes Dorothy to an old house and locks her in a room. She imagines that she sees the wizard talking to her in an old TV, so like the uh, crystal ball thing. The three friends tail them and find the truck parked by the house. The tough orders Dorothy to uh, remove her clothing. There is brief nudity in this film, but the friends break in. Dorothy, who has refused to remove her red shoes for whatever reason, kicks the tough in a very uncomfortable place. The lion seals the deal by socking him out, and they all escape. They drive back to the city. Uh, there is also swearing, as one declares we're off to see the leaping wizard. They converge on a hotel where the wizard is known to be staying. The wizard is having a party, but they manage to get in. Dorothy goes in a bedroom where some dirty deeds are afoot. Uh, she exits, then goes back in. I don't know. The deed is done, and she finds the wizard having a shower in the bathroom. Dorothy hops in the shower. This ain't your mama's Wizard of Oz. Where they discuss how makeup and stage effects make the wizard who he is. The shopkeeper enters, Glenn, being in actuality the wizard's agent, and they exit to do an interview to Dorothy's disappointment. The three friends then come in, this bathroom is Grand Central, and they comfort Dorothy that they'll always be there for her. She is still despondent that the wizard has left her and breaks a mirror. This serves at the end of the dream, and she awakens outside the car accident, surrounded by the concerned band. Overall, this is an adaption with some neat ideas that are very badly relayed. There's largely bad acting, slow pacing, it's cheaply shot, and noticeably so. The song Livin' in the Land of Oz gets far more airplay than it should. 1978, The Wiz. Some of you may have seen this one. I saw it as a kid. I haven't seen it again until now, so it's practically new. I was amazed to find out that the screenplay was by Joel Schumacher, of all people, and directed by famous film director Sidney Lumet, those classic black men, if they're not black, in case you're wondering. Also, Quincy Jones did the music, the late, great Quincy Jones. With that, Diana Ross, Michael Jackson, Lena Horne, and arguably Richard Pryor, we definitely have royalty here. Not the greatest overdubbing, though. It seems to be a 70s slash early 80s thing. We open on the big city with people arriving in an apartment for a holiday get-together. Grown gal Dorothy feels uncomfortable and alone in the group. Also, you can tell this is Sidney Lumet by the way people are arranged in each scene. Anyhow, contrary-wise to the way the story is often told, Dorothy is reluctant to spread her wings, and Aunt M encourages her to get out and see the world. Dorothy's dog gets out and she runs out in a snowstorm, haha, <laughs> a gale, to find him. The wind comes roaring down the street in the form of a twister and catches her up. She flies through the stars and comes down in an unknown part of the city. Graffiti people come alive with her presence and come off the brick walls. Dorothy has crash-landed in Oz, evidenced by her literally crashing through a large Oz sign, and breaking off part of it right on top of the Wicked Witch of the East, a.k.a. Evermean. What a great name. The Good Witch of Munchkinland, which here is a playground where the kids were formerly not able to play, greets her and explains there are three more witches of the land, including herself, the Witch of the West, and Glinda, dang, accuracy! She gives Dorothy the Witch of the East's shoes, silver slippers, and after a long song and dance routine, directs her to the Yellow Brick Road. However, the witch and munchkins disappear before they tell her how to get there. Dorothy sets off on her own. Soon she comes upon a group of crows, which are also men. Is this a bit of a dig at racism here? Uh, they are torturing a scarecrow. 
She scares away the crows, helps him down, and together they find the yellow brick road, which cue the perpetually catchy ease on down the road. The road leads them to a broken down amusement park slash Coney Island, where they come upon the tin man pinioned under a statue. I must say the sets and costumes are particularly impressive in this movie. They rescue him and after another song set off again. Next, they come to the New York Public Library with the lion statues in the front. The cowardly lion breaks out of one and demonstrates his ferocity slash cowardice. Next, the road leads them down into a subway station. A street vendor who has been on their trail follows them down, and here is where the nightmare fuel kicks in. Take that, The Shining. He sets two marionettes going, which grow in size and come to life coming after the friends. Next, they get attacked by pretty much everything. Garbage cans, electric boxes, the pillars themselves. The lion steps in to rescue his companions, and they escape to the street. Rounding the corner, they end up trapped in what appears to be a sex trade gang who capture Dorothy and the lion with a whiff of poppy perfume. The Tin Man and Scarecrow follow them to a rooftop and are able to revive them. The lion is remorseful about not being able to protect his friends, but Dorothy sings the absolute showstopper, Be a Lion. The view from the rooftop displays the city, lit up in green with the road winding around it and the sun rising as a (laughs) big apple. The friends enter the city where the denizens sing about their affinity for the color green, at least until the loudspeakered voice of the whiz directs them to red, then gold. The loudspeaker tells them to send up Dorothy, but not her friends. She refuses to go alone, and he relents. An elevator brings them to an upper floor where they are greeted by a giant fire-breathing robotic head with laser eyes. He cuts a deal that he will grant their requests when they kill the Witch of the West. Despite her misgivings, Dorothy cuts the deal. A route through the sewers takes them to the witch's literal sweatshop, where the witch breaks into the bouncy gospel-esque No Bad News. She summons her riding flying monkeys to track down the trespassers. They chase the companions through a multi-level parking garage area and finally corner them. The witch tortures Dorothy's friends until she agrees to give up the shoes. Not knowing what else to do, Dorothy trips the fire alarm, setting off the sprinklers and melting the witch. Cue a joyous dance routine and a song, Can't You Feel a Brand New Day? This is a very long routine. I think there are more songs in this version than in the 1939. The spell being broken, the friends hitch a ride with the monkeys back to the wizard and enter through the back door. They catch him unprepared and realize he is a fake. Herman Smith is a failed politician who landed in Oz during a political stunt in a hot air balloon, a.k.a. Richard Pryor, who does his shtick for a few minutes. Dorothy's friends are sad until she points out they've had what they all long for all along. But things look bad for Dorothy herself until Glinda, the eternally youthful and luminous Lena Horne, appears and sings directions for her to return home. Then Dorothy sings a very long, though spectacular song, which, assisted by the heel clicks, gets her home. Also, Stan Winston did the makeup effects. How cool is that? 1978. Manga Sekai Mukashi Banashi. This is a Japanese cartoon fairy tale series, and that's all I have to relate because I could not find the episode in question. So, unfortunately, I was unable to watch this one. If you have seen it, please let me know down in the comments. Next up, 1982, an anime version of The Wizard of Oz, otherwise known as Ozu no Mahotsukai. Uh, This one is pretty popular. I remember seeing it at my video store as a kid, but I myself have never seen it. The version on YouTube that I watched is not exactly remastered, so at times it's so fuzzy it's hard to tell what's going on. Uh, Also, this is the dubbed in English version that I watched. So we begin with Aunt Em and Uncle Henry going out for the day, leaving Dorothy and Toto to mind the homestead. They are figuring out how to while away the time when a storm suddenly springs up out of nowhere. Her aunt and uncle do turn back, but they don't get back in time. Dorothy gets knocked out, and the storm in a lull, I guess, it magically picks up the house and flies them to Oz. She is greeted by the munchkins, who are all grown folk with belled hats, accurate, who thank her for crushing the Witch of the East. Also, there are four witches. Accuracy. Oh, I love accuracy. Mention is made of the Great Desert. Dorothy puts on the witch's red shoes and sets off on the yellow brick road. The good witch protects her with a kiss. Dorothy wonders how her house is going to get back to Kansas, which is a great point. 
In quick succession, Dorothy meets up with the Scarecrow, the Tin Man, and the Lion, all in typical fashion. There is a cute moment after the Lion decides to join them. He gives Toto a ride on his back. The Yellow Brick Road runs out at a chasm, and the Lion takes them in turns by leaping over. They then come to another forest and get set upon by a Kaleida. This one is really accurate in many ways so far. I'm loving it. Upon getting to the Emerald City, uh, no glasses. I was disappointed. They gain an audience with the wizard in turns, and the wizard tells each they must destroy the Witch of the West. The witch herself, a gray old lady with an eye patch, sees the companions approaching from afar, and sends a pack of wolves after them. The woodman attacks them with his axe, whereupon the wolves disappear, as they aren't real. Uh, since the wolves didn't work, the witch calls on a giant crow. The scarecrow takes the oil can and covers the crow with it. Uh, a little confusing. The woodman slicks across the crow and lights it on fire. Woo! Having absolutely had it by this point, the witch calls the flying monkeys to take the friends prisoner so she can deal with them herself. So this part is semi-accurate. The monkeys take her friends, but they cannot take Dorothy without her explicit permission, as she has the mark from the Good Witch of the North. She does have them take her so she can be with her friends. The, her friends encourage her to run, which she does with the witch in pursuit throughout the castle. Toto chews off the lion's bonds, who catches up in time to save Dorothy when she falls off a breaking stone bridge. He also frees the other two who help to take down the guards. The witch uses magic to tie them up again, but she cannot touch Dorothy. She again goes in pursuit of the little girl who becomes trapped at the top of a stair. She manages to push over a large urn of water uh, to roll it down the stairs at the witch. And the water, of course, makes the witch melt. The four come back to see the wizard together, who only manifests this time as a voice. He tries to put them off, but Toto trips a hidden switch, causing the throne dais to rise, revealing the real wizard. He eventually offers to bring Dorothy back, but Toto runs off as the balloon leaves. He is brought back by Glinda, who says he took refuge in her castle. She must live really close. She explains to Dorothy how to get home. Dorothy clicks her heels together and arrives home, running back over the hill to her waiting aunt and uncle, and farmhouse also returned somehow. So yes, this one was reasonably accurate to the book, and I was pleasantly surprised. 1987, The Wonderful Wizard of Oz, another animated series. Uh, unfortunately, I couldn't get a lot of visuals for this one uh, off ye old internet, and if I go back and try to get visuals, it's going to set off my algorithms on my computer again, saying, oh, you want to see everything, Wizard of Oz, and I'm sorry, I'm not willing to do that, so please bear with me through this one as I explain the very rather interesting plot. The introduction is done with early computer animation, um... It's also narrated by Margot Kidder. The animation itself is a, a slightly odd style, I thought, but it's not bad. Dorothy, Aunt Em, and Uncle Henry are as we know them. Dorothy is excited by the prospect of seeing a twister for the first time, but she has yet to experience one. She is a little girl of great imagination. When she dreams, she dreams of a strange and beautiful land, terrifying creatures, and of being away from home and not able to get back. The next day, her aunt and uncle gift her with a little dog. As in the last version, Em and Henry head out to town and try to head back when they see a twister heading for their farm. They arrive too late. Dorothy and Toto get carried away to Oz and land in Munchkin Land. There is a brief, touching flashback where we see Em and Henry mourning the loss of Dorothy over the wreckage of their house. Although Em is determined, the little girl is still alive. Back in Oz, the crushed witch's body turns into a bat-shaped specter and disappears, leaving only the shoes. The Munchkins come out, then the Good Witch appears and tells Dorothy all about Oz. The Good Witch then casts a spell. A giant stone tablet appears with writing on it. Uh, the Witch reads it, and it states that Dorothy should go to the Emerald City. The Witch gives her the shoes, which she says will protect her on the trip, as well as a kiss. They find the Scarecrow fairly quickly, then in the forest they come upon the Tin Man, who tells him his story in a rare flashback. We get to see what he used to look like, as well as the Witch of the East. On the heels of this event, we meet up with the lion, they travel to another forest, and are pursued by a Kaleida. While the lion and scarecrow distract it, the tin man skips directly to felling a tree with his axe so they can cross the chasm and escape. The yellow brick road next heads underwater at a broad stream. The scarecrow makes a raft and pulls them almost across before the current catches them. His pole gets stuck and he on it before the lion jumps in and swims the raft to shore. Soon after, they cross the field of poppies. The lion manages to head through the field somewhat, but he can't make it all the way. The other two pick up and move Dorothy and Toto, and they catch up to the sleeping lion. They get Dorothy all the way to safety, and then they save the queen of mice from a pursuing cat. In gratitude, the queen enlists her subjects, who are wearing little masks, to carry the lion from the field. 
The companions then find the road again. At first, the guardian of the gates doesn't want to let them in, but the Witch of the North uses the kiss on Dorothy's forehead to cast a spell on him. It's very weird. The friends gain entrance to the throne room one at a time. Dorothy sees the giant head, which emerges out of the wall. It's very cool. The friends man are getting into winky country. Finally, it is called that. The witch sees them coming in her magic mirror and sends wolves after them. The tin man fights them off with straight-up street fighting. How kind-hearted of him. Next, she sends her crows. The scarecrow takes his turn, doing nothing more than standing as scarecrows tend to do. But this is enough to unnerve the crows and send them packing, so redemption for the scarecrow. Lastly, she sends a group of Winky warriors. The friends find a lone cabin with an old Winky, who states that all the other Winkies are slaves except for him. The guards come upon the cabin and are scared off by the lion. As a last resort, the witch brings out the magic cap, oh yeah, here we go, and calls the winged monkeys. This is the last time they can do a favor for her. They carry the friends off and bring them to the castle. The witch imprisons them separately and discovers she can't take Dorothy's shoes, so she forces her to do chores while she attempts to figure out the problem. One of the chores is carrying water from the well in the basement, and Dorothy wonders why the well is placed so far away from everything else. The lion manages to break out of his cell and finds Dorothy. The witch casts a spell to turn the lion to stone and puts a ring of fire around Toto. The little dog manages to get out and upsets a bowl of water, which splashes the witch. He also shakes himself off on her. It's very cute. This makes them realize that water does something to the witch, and in short order, she is melted away. Then her fortress disappears along with her. At this point... Mombi and Tip come into the story from the sequel, The Land of Oz. Mombi is pals with the witch and is coming to see her, only to get the news that she and the fortress are gone. Not to lose an opportunity, Mombi determines to find the hat that will call the flying monkeys. Uh, Dorothy has already found and obtained this. Meanwhile, Dorothy figures out how to use the cap herself. Meanwhile, meanwhile, Mombi tries a different tack, brewing a potion to change herself into a cat. The friends catch her trying to steal the hat, and Tip explains how the witch is their mommy, but doesn't really mean to be bad. No. Dorothy offers to call the monkeys to take them both back to their home, which they do. The Winkies party down at the demise of their despot and ask for the Tin Man to be their king, bingo! Our friends leave to journey back to the Emerald City, get lost without the path, and come across a massive spider. Dorothy decides to try the cap to get them out of there and finds that it helps her call upon all monkeys. One explains to the lion how he needs to step up and help protect the forest creatures from the giant, probably misunderstood, monster. This he finally does, along with help from the Tin Man. Eventually, the creature falls off a cliff edge, but comes back due to its size. It didn't fall that far. The two friends work together to make it fall again, this time for good. The forest creatures thank them and ask the lion to be their king. Then Dorothy finally calls the monkeys, who fly them back to the city. Back at the city, they visit the wizard again, and Toto unmasks him. He shows them how his disguises work, and gives them their requested gifts, including the promise of a mutual balloon ride home for Dorothy. The balloon, though, leaves without her. Dorothy attempts to call the winged monkeys to fly her home, but they explain that they cannot cross the desert, so the cap is now useless to Dorothy. They tell her to call on Glinda for help, which she does. Dorothy also gives the cap up to Glinda for safekeeping. Dorothy journeys back home, and she even runs over the hill to find her aunt, an uncle and rebuilt house again. Okay, here we go. Interesting, interesting. 1988, a Polish version entitled That. This one is another series and another animation. However, it's stop motion. The main characters are dolls and the backgrounds are drawn in a distinctive style, highly reminiscent of Terry Gilliam. It's enjoyable to look at, yet equally, it's nightmare inducing. We begin at Dorothy's home, and apparently Kansas is a barren apocalyptic wasteland. The tornado comes almost immediately without her aunt and uncle leaving. Henry gets caught outside. Em goes down in the storm cellar, but the house lifts off its foundations before Dorothy can follow. Oz is a technicolor paradise as much as ever, and somehow it all reminds me of a serial ad. The good witch kisses Dorothy, gives her the shoes, sets her on the yellow brick road. Then she meets the scarecrow and Tin Man. Not a lot different here except the song they sing while walking, which is fairly catchy. Then the lion, all in the same way as well. The difference here is in the Witch of the West, not only keeping an eye on them from the telescope in her far-off tower, but she attempts to interfere with their progress. She is the one who sends the Kaleidas, who makes pointy rocks grow in the river while they raft, and also makes the poppy field grow. The mice carry out the lion as before, and the queen of the mice gives Dorothy a whistle to blow should she ever be in need. When they get to the Emerald City at last, this is the first version I have seen to incorporate the green glasses. 
We spend a bit more time than the other versions in observing the city and its inhabitants. The friends get admitted to the throne room, where there is an actual throne on which first appears flames, which then turn into the disembodied head. Things progress as expected, and the group heads out west to find the witch. They get picked up by the flying monkeys, imprisoned, Dorothy carries water, Toto goes for the witch, she gets splashed, etc. Dorothy cleans away the water and finds the key to free the lion from his magic cage. The scarecrow was disembodied and the tin man left to rust, but the Winkies fix them up and give everyone gifts, including a cool hat for Dorothy. They also free a young man called Tip. The friends begin the long walk back, but encounter difficulties. Dorothy uses her whistle, but the mice suggest she use her cap to call the monkeys instead. She does, and they get a free lift back to the Emerald City. Without their green glasses, they see the city in glorious technicolor. The wizard's throne is hidden by screens as he tells them he cannot grant their requests. Toto simply knocks the screens over to reveal the wizard. Now, the wizard may not be too great at actual magic, but he can sing and proves it. So the Scarecrow is made King of Oz. We have the wizard in the balloon, Toto going after the cat, Dorothy missing her ride. She tries the cat, but it's no-go with the monkeys, so they journey to find Glinda. On the way, the woodman and lion are made respective kings of the forest and the field. Dorothy espies Tip through a telescope and sees him create Jack Pumpkinhead. They come to a series of jagged rocks guarded by literal live hammers and have to use the cap one last time to get the monkeys to fly them clear. They then find Glinda and give her the cap. She calls the monkeys to bring Dorothy's companions back to their respective new homes and then sets the monkeys free. Dorothy's shoes carry her and Toto through the air. She arrives in a lush green field just outside her house and greets her aunt. This is the end of episode six. There are ten episodes which seem to go into the second book. So, although somehow Dorothy wound up being involved, I cut it off there. 1992, another animated version, The Wonderful Galaxy of Oz, or Oznobuken. This is a series, but it was also edited into a movie in 1996 for the English version, and it is this one that I watched, and maybe I shouldn't have because it was really hard to follow. To those of us who watch cartoons around this time, the English voice cast sounds pretty familiar, but the voices are uncredited, so I wasn't able to place anyone. As expected, Dorothy lives on the new Kansas planet with Star Wars S technology available. She is out watching the sky for a rare phenomenon of three suns aligning while her uncle and aunt keep in touch through radio. The alignment causes nasty weather. Her aunt and uncle head for shelter, but Dorothy gets stuck in a rocket along with Toto and the family retainer, a droid. Her only chance is to launch the rocket. Once in orbit, her aunt and uncle direct her to stay there until the storm passes, but she gets sucked into a black hole and blasted to another galaxy instead. She comes out in the middle of a fierce space war between two competing factions and crash lands on a nearby planet. She is gre greeted by Plant Man, I guess. They wonder how he can talk as plants don't have brains, huh? He was created by a witch who was trying to make a monster, but her plans were foiled by Oz, a great scientist. Dorothy decides to find this Oz. They set out in a space jeep. Since we've already got a scarecrow and tin man, they come across the lion, a space lion? The witch, aka Gloomhilda, goes after them and sets a large robot at them, but Dorothy's suit inflates and flies her to safety. As thanks for defeating the witch, city guards pick them up and bring them to the city, I don't know if it was named, where they are greeted as heroes. They go to see the wizard, a giant head with hands who interacts with them but also seems incredibly unhinged. Toto and Dorothy find the wizard to be a disguise, a mechanical setup run by a little boy in a control room. The boy claims everything was invented by his father, the actual Oz. <sighs> Again, this version diverts enough that it's kind of hard to follow if you take your eyes off it. Gloomhilda is looking for the rainbow crystal so she can rule the universe, and Dorothy and her companions, including Oz Jr., fly off to try to find it first because this is the thing that can probably grant their wishes. The wizard himself we see piloting his own little ship before he puts himself into hypersleep and blasts into a star or, or something. The companions see a news report that the wizard ship has been found and they soon intercept the ship itself, confirming that the wizard is apparently gone. Next, Gloomhilda catches up with them and fires upon them. They head away and towards a large light. A crystal nymph generated by the rainbow crystal appears on deck and guides their way. Apparently, they must be pure of heart and not fight with others in order to find the dang thing. So then Oz Jr., a.k.a. Mosey, 
leaves the ship and races around in another space jeep to work out his anger issues. But because he really is pure of heart, he is led to where his dad has been doing science, figuring out where to find the crystal. Mosey's friends join him, and the whole group is together. Okay, so Gloomhilda uses a bug to spy on the group's discussion, and the wizard says where to find the crystal so she takes off. But the group knew they were being spied on, so this is all a fake-out. The group heads to where they can find the real crystal. Gloomhilda finally catches up with them, and finds, as they did, that the crystal is not solid, and so cannot be carried off. The Witch of the West, who apparently is a different person, directs Gloomhilda through a jewel around her neck. She now takes control and makes the crystal solid through Gloomhilda's touch. This returns the witch to solid form as well. It turns out she's Gloomhilda's mother, and she looks a bit like Shadow Weaver from She-Ra, and she is able to wield the crystal. The group takes off in their ship to attempt to flee the witch who pursues them. They make it back to the city and tell the military to plan for an attack. The battle doesn't go well, as the crystal is too powerful. Dorothy decides that they'll have to sneak into the witch's fortress and steal the crystal. They soon encounter the witch and have to evade her magic. However, when they are cornered, Gloomhilda steps in and takes the crystal from her mother. She says she admires Dorothy and her friends for standing by each other, and wishes her mother would do the same. Well, good for her. The witch turns Gloomhilda, holding the crystal, and her henchies to stone. Dorothy and her friends take the opportunity to run away down the hall. The witch pursues them, setting fire spells that cause havoc around the fortress. They head back to their ship, although Dorothy manages to rescue Broomhilda out of gratitude, having the statue with the crystal moved on board the ship before escaping. They head back to the city. The wizard figures out that the crystal works by picking up on the goodness of people's hearts. Meanwhile, the witch's fortress, which floats, has pursued them, crash lands in the city, and the witch morphs into a giant monster. Then Dorothy figures out they can use the crystal simply by everyone wishing on it at once. The witch goes back into the jewel, and Broomhilda comes alive. I'm sorry, have I been saying Broomhilda? Ah, have it. Gloomhilda, my bad. Gloomhilda comes alive and decides to be good. Everyone else gets their wish as well. Finally, Dorothy wishes separately on the crystal for it to send her back home. She, her droid, and the dog get shot through space on a rainbow bridge and crash land on the flowery fields outside the farmhouse in New Kansas. And I am exhausted. This really wasn't that long, but boy, did it seem like it. Another animation, 1995, part of the World Fairy Tale series, a.k.a. Anime Sekai no Doa. It's a cartoon fairy tale series, and unfortunately, this episode was not found. I could not watch it. Sorry, everyone. Skipping ahead 10 years to 2005, The Muppet Wizard of Oz, which, surprise, surprise, is not animated. This one stars Ashanti. It also has Queen Latifah, David Allen Greer, um, a cameo by Quentin Tarantino, and it's good clean fun as so many Muppet movies are. Okay, so Ashanti plays Dorothy in this one. We find her in a small town in Kansas where she lives with her aunt and uncle. She waitresses for them in their diner, but longs to get out and become a music star. She gets her chance when the Muppets come to town holding auditions for a new singing person for something or other. I missed what? She longs to go to the audition, but her aunt says, no, 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 you have to work. Her uncle relents and lets her go, though. So she gets to the audition, but she is just too late to sing. She manages to hand her CD over to the Muppets as they leave on the bus. Then she goes home to their trailer and gets in big trouble for having left the diner while she was in the middle of working. Her aunt sits down, even though a twister is coming like it's right outside the window, they sit down and she gives her niece a talking to. Finally, they decide the storm is close enough, they have to get to shelter, so they run up the path to the local storm shelter. Ashanti is almost there, but then realizes she has to go back because she forgot Toto. Toto is her pet prawn, and this being the Muppets, I think you can see where this is going. She gets back into the trailer, and the tornado picks them up and flies them to Oz. Once they get to Oz, her prawn has turned into a Muppet, but with a very familiar accent. They come out into Munchkin Land and have landed upon the Witch of the East, who is not quite dead and attempts to lift the building off herself, but then she loses her grip and it falls on top of her and now she is really dead. 
The Good Witch of the North and the Wicked Witch of the East are both played by Miss Piggy. In fact, all the witches are played by Miss Piggy because they are all sisters. Ashanti gets given these slippers, which she at first doesn't want to take, but she sets off down the road willingly enough when she realizes that they are super fancy shoes, because why not? She comes across Kermit as the Scarecrow, then Gonzo as the Tin Man, uh, which is kind of cute, he's an actual robot, and then Fozzie Bear as the Lion. While traveling through the forest, they come upon Kaleidas, who are critic Kaleidas, and you'll never guess who play them. They have to cross a log with the Kaleidas shouting criticism at them the entire time, so they have to overcome their own self-doubt in order to cross. On the way, they also come across not a poppy field, but a poppy-centered club where everything inside smells like poppies. So Dorothy uh, falls asleep, as well as the lion, as well as Toto. They have to call upon the, it's actually the munchkins, but it's the rats. The rats are playing the munchkins, and they did say that if they ever are in need to call upon them, so they do. The rats put on gas masks and spirit the friends out. Soon they come to the Emerald City. They put on the glasses, but that's only once they get into the throne room. It is meant to protect them against the magnificence of Oz. Oz shapeshifts for the friends. Um, for, you know, there's the head, there's the lady, there's a dragon. Um, and these are all done by computer animation, which is honestly not very good. But, I mean, come on, we're not going to the Muppets for computer animation, necessarily. Anyway, they have to go and defeat the Witch of the West. The Witch of the West, again, is also Miss Piggy, and uh, she's got quite a neat little leather getup with an eye patch and everything. The Flying Monkeys are her group, and they are a motorcycle gang who ride on their flying motorcycles and uh, sing some impressive show-stopping tunes. To make a long story short, because this video is running long by now, uh, they do defeat the Witch of the West, and uh, she's pretty much melted and gone. They get back to the Emerald City, and their wishes are pretty much granted. Ashanti's dream is to become a music star as aforementioned, so the wizard, who is revealed to be Jeffrey Tambor, uh, puts on a live broadcast uh, and sets her up to sing. However, she stops halfway because she realizes that this not only is not necessarily what she wants, but it also isn't real. If she's going to be a star, she has to make it on her own and not just be handed it. So Dorothy ends up traveling back to Munchkinland. Uh, the Witch of the North is there, and also Glinda, the Good Witch of the South, who tells her that she can click her heels together three times, and then she'll be able to go wherever she wants. So Dorothy is taken home to Aunt M by the Slipper's magic. When she gets there, she reunites with her aunt and uncle, all is happy, and then Kermit stops back into their little diner and tells her that they loved her CD and they have chosen her to sing with them after all. So all is happy, la la la. 2007, the Tin Man miniseries from Sci-Fi, or Siffy, if you will. I was there. I was there when they changed their name, and it's... I'm sorry, I still... Ugh. Anyway, it's a channel original. In this one, we join young but grown gal D.G. in her farmhouse in Kansas, where she lives with her mother and father. She works in the local diner in a familiar-looking uniform. She has peculiar recurring dreams. She is a good artist and gifted mechanically, and she longs to get away and have adventures. We cut to presumably Oz, where the sorceress, i.e. the Wicked Witch, confers with her special police regarding an emerald she is searching for but has not yet found. She states that she must find it before the upcoming double eclipse, and goes to a psychic who she has imprisoned to try to track the thing down. He sees, among other things, a vision of the Gale farmhouse. Back in this world, the tornado not only converges on the Gale farm, but so did the witch's police. They attack, and the family runs for the upper floor and out on the roof, during which it becomes apparent that her parents know more about all this than they have let on. They tell her to jump into the tornado, and they follow suit, narrowly escaping. DG awakens in what appears to be Canada, but then Canada doesn't have two sons, I think, unless they're hiding one. Anyway, the munchkins here are resistance fighters with a village hidden up in the trees, Ewok style. They inform DG they saw her parents heading down the old brick route leading to Central City, but they suspect her of being a spy and take her prisoner. 
She meets and teams up with fellow prisoner Glitch, Alan Cumming, whose brains have been taken from his head by the enemy due to his knowing things he shouldn't. DG and Glitch escape through the forest and come upon a cabin with what appears to be a family getting assaulted by the guards. This turns out to be a projection machine showing an event of the past. Standing in the yard is a diver's suit. The two manage to open it, and a man who was trapped inside is now free. This is Neil McDonough. He cleans up and promptly plans to take revenge on the attack on his family. He also takes with him his old sheriff star. Ha, it's the Tin Star. I get it. The two others tag along with him to the old brick route. Heading through a large thicket, they come upon a creature imprisoned by the Pape runners to wait until they come back to eat it. It puts up a front to attack them, but it backs off as soon as Tin Star Dude, aka Wyatt Kane, pulls his gun. The Pape runners, ooh, bad effects, but then again I've seen the Langoliers, so this is Oscar-worthy by comparison. They return and attack, and the group jumps off a cliff to avoid them. Meanwhile, the sorceress, her name is Ascadelia, is updated on events by the psychic and realizes the girl is DG, who she knows. She then has her guards exhume a grave and finds the coffin empty. She heads to a magical prison she has created wherein we find the good sorceress. DG bonds with their new companion named Raw. He proves to be a viewer, a.k.a. a psychic, apparently someone who can see, but his ability has been removed. Kane has a wound from the papes, and Raw soothes the pain. He realizes Kane is a tin man, a.k.a. a former Central City policeman. They are spied on by a flying monkey who returns to report to the sorceress. DG spies a mile marker and recognizes it. She has drawn it from her dreams and remembers her father's old saying about the old road. She finds a rundown village called Milltown, which appears to be a Wild West town set, and recognizes this as well from her father's stories. The inhabitants who appear to have been through a war are unfriendly to strangers, but then her parents appear and greet her. They inform her that they are not in fact her parents, but robots programmed as parental units. An elder of the town tells her the real story of how her real mother arranged for her to escape the dangers of that world for a time until her return when she was older and ready. He seals her palm with a sigil that will help protect her. He tells her to go to Central City to see the Mystic Man, who may have more answers and help. Back on the road, the group sees wanted posters for DG. Kane pulls over a traveling show truck whose owner he recognizes and persuades him to give them a ride so they can enter the city without interference. The owner gives them tickets to the show of the Mystic Man. Meanwhile, again, the parent bots are brought in and questioned by Ascadelia, who is never at a loss for different ways to get updates. The group heads to the cabaret-style show, uh, the introduction of which is presided over by Richard Dreyfuss's floating head. The man himself then appears in a floating throne on stage. He engages in a question and answer session with the audience, into which drugs figure heavily the, again, this ain't your mama's Oz. The sorceress has managed to get him addicted. Kane has separated from the group prior to the show, pursuing his vengeful vendetta against Zero, new head of the guards and engineer of the attack on Kane's family. Zero and guards bust into the club, but DG and her friends slip out. DG heads for the back to question the mystic man. Two of the guards find her, and Kane follows and dispatches them. DG shoots her questions at the largely unhelpful MM, although he does dimly recall helping to get her out of the OZ, outer zone, where they live, as a child. Kane commandeers the traveling show truck, and out they head. The sorceress nabs MM and questions him, to no avail. The group heads into the snowy mountains, where the truck breaks down and they have to continue on foot. The sorceress uses her psychic to question M.M. further, finally getting some answers as to where D.G. is. In the mountains, D.G. gets frustrated and attacks the ice with a handy axe, revealing a locked door, which the sigil on her palm serves to unlock. They find themselves in a giant castle hall with a large oil painting showing D.G.'s mother as queen and Glitch as her advisor. Up the stairs the friends go, but no one is at home. Raw uses his psychicness to link with a mirror showing scenes from the past. Turns out, Ascadelia is DG's older sister, who tried to kill her. Her mother saves her daughter, but knows her older daughter will try again. She imparts to DG the secret of the emerald, which is the only thing to stop Ascadelia. Then the sorceress herself appears in the room, having finally decided that if you want something done, you gotta do it yourself. She shows DG a magic lantern, which displays their mother crying out for her younger daughter. DG smashes the lantern as a distraction so the friends can escape. Ascadelia then releases the flying monkeys who attack. 
Kane, for his part, battles with Zero, who shoots him. Kane crashes through the icy wall and into a frozen lake. The monkeys carry DG to the sorceress, who uses her power to reset DG back into the real world, or so it seems. When DG's parents question her too closely about the emerald, she realizes it's all a ruse, and then the sorceress takes her prisoner. End part one. Part two. Glitch wakes up on the floor of the castle, heads outside, and finds the unconscious Kane, who he puts in the truck to warm up. Kane's child's toy was in his pocket, and stopped the bullet. Raw is put in prison and finds fellow members of his species who refuse to recognize him as one of their own. The sorceress tortures her psychic as he tries to use DG to focus. It doesn't work, and they stick her behind bars as well. The mystic man is in the cell across the way, but he points out they are probably being listened to, so they manipulate their conversation accordingly. He does tell her that Ascadelia needs the emerald to make a machine work, which will destroy the OZ. The sorceress gets tired of getting nowhere with them, so she kills the mystic man. DG tries a few different ways to get out of prison, which don't work. A little scruffy dog wanders into the cell and pushes on the mechanism, releasing her. Kane and Glitch travel to the prison to rescue them, coming upon a group of guards. Glitch demonstrates his power of dance and dispatches them. DG releases Raw and they find the other two friends dressed as guards. The dog leads the way and they escape the prison. Then the dog proves to be another prisoner, human prisoner, in disguise. The sorceress, however, agreed to release him so he can get the friends to lead him to the Emerald. He was the tutor of the sisters when they were children. Ha ha ha, Toto slash tutor. The group heads south, as the magic man said to. DG keeps having visions of her childhood, proving Ascadelia was a good sister initially and always looked out for her younger sister. Glitch sees a disc, dropped by the tutor. The winged monkey is following them, taking the discs as reports back to the sorceress, as the monkey drops down after it. Kane shoots the monkey dead, at which the sorceress nearly collapses. DG's visions continue to direct her through the forest to a small cavern she explored with her sister as a child. The sisters found a large carving of a stone face, behind which was an evil witch. She attacked Ascadelia and possessed her. Back in the now, DG's memories lead her back to their summer home, which is disguised as part of the forest. A hologram of her mother directs her father along her journey. Ascadelia and her soldiers head out on the trail to follow them. They get to the summer home and see the hologram as well. Kane figures out the tutor is leaving information for the sorceress. To find DG's father, they must journey to the realm of the unwanted. The tutor, feeling remorse, leads them in total form to the entrance hidden in a field, and they head underground to find a hidden city. They get directions to someone who can help them, but walk into a trap. The lads are taken prisoner by the guards, except Toto, who escapes. But the man they came to see, the Seeker, gets DG to safety. Turns out he's her dad! Meanwhile, Ascadelia is having doubts, and the spirit within her tells her to chill out. She sees a vision from when the girls were children, and leaving a magic message for their father to find some day. Well, she goes in search of it, but the message is gone, so Ascadelia sends her monkeys out to trace the magic, and thusly her father. They find his lair where he has hidden DG. The guards lead the lads back through the forest, but are set upon by a team of stunt people, <coughs> I mean, uh, rebels, who take the guards prisoner and query them about the machine. Glitch discovers the brains that have been removed from his head are what powers the machine. DG's father is an inventor. He gives her a compass that will lead her to her heart's desire and they head off in a hot air balloon to a different spot in the forest, where they discover a hidden door to a vast family crypt, including her great-grandmother, Dorothy Gale. Other Easter egg plaques read Zoroaster, Ginger, and Polychrome. DG goes into her great-grandma's crypt and finds herself in a ghostly representation of her home farm, then encounters a young girl ghost version of Dorothy, who gives her the emerald she has been seeking. Naturally, Ascadelia arrives with more soldiers, imprisons their father, takes the emerald, and sticks DG in the crypt. Toto sniffs her out and goes to get the companions to rescue her. DG, however, summons her powers, which she has finally manifested, and manages to escape on her own. They all meet halfway. Ascadelia, who has imprisoned the other sorceress, aka her mother, has her mother moved to the castle so she can have both parents as prisoners and gloat properly. The eclipse begins, and with it, she can also begin the ritual. The lads find the machine. Glitch recalls how to stop it, but they are interrupted by the guards. There is a tussle. Meanwhile, DG confronts her sister, who is engaged in the ritual, and manages to talk her down. The witch, separated from Ascadelia, claims she doesn't need a corporeal form now that the ritual has begun, but the combined magic of the sisters works to combat her. 
The lads defeat the guards and manage to shut down the machine, melting the witch into a puddle of sticky black goo. Ugh. The family has found a home in each other again. <sighs> Two thousand seven, the Veggie Tales Wizard of Haas. I have never seen Veggie Tales, and seeing it uh, when you're older, and it 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 didn't. Um, I don't know. It, it wasn't for me, I guess. But you know, I gave it a shot. So, okay, this one is apparently a mashup between the Wizard Story and the Prodigal Son with songs. We. A little stalk of asparagus is longing for some fun beyond the grind of his dad's dental floss farm and wants a day of fun at the amusement park, the land of Haas. <clears throat> Sorry. He sets out on his own, accompanied by his faithful pig Tutu, and heads for shelter in a trailer when a tornado crosses his path. The tornado picks him up and puts him down in a magical, colorful, munchy land with the good witch Splenda. The inhabitants pick one of their denizens, old Yellow McToad, and tell the asparagus, aka Darby, to follow him. In quick succession, Darby meets a scarecrow, Tin Man, and Lion, who are all looking for some fun, and decide to go with him. They have to cross the field of distracting puppies, but eventually they get to the park and have a blast. Then the friends get sick and tired from too much fun, and Darby runs out of money. When he threatens the park manager with telling the public that the park is less than expected, the manager drops him through a trapdoor into a celled pit. His friends get him out, and they confront the bully that has been following them this whole time, but the bully gets understanding, and the return of his parents instead. Darby gets home, and although he's not certain he will be welcomed as part of the family anymore due to his actions stealing money and all, however, his father welcomes him back with open arms. Tom and Jerry, Wizard of Oz, circa 2011. This one is basically the 1939 movie, just an animated version, and with Tom and Jerry added. Much of it just follows the movie. Everything happens as in the movie, but Tom and Jerry are Dorothy's friends on the farm. They wind up going to Oz with her, and much slapstick ensues. Also, that cute little mouse that's in all the Tom and Jerry cartoons, I don't know its name. Uh, it is a munchkin that goes along with them. They do not go with Dorothy and her friends on the journey. They follow after her and kind of have their own adventures encountering the witch and like i said basically a lot of slapstick they do as it turns out at the end of all things when it gets to the witch chasing dorothy and her friends through her castle tom and jerry are the ones who manage to get the bucket of water to her so they are able to dispatch the witch and all is well to animation fans, there are many common names in this, such as Gray Delisle and Rob Paulson. Okay, so this is fun because uh, this video, of course, is already way longer than I expected. I am so sorry. Uh, next time, I promise I won't ramble as much. I'll just hit highlights. I have learned something today. Anyway, no, I'm rambling again. I was just about done with this when one of my kids speaks up and says, what about the Phineas and Ferb episode of The Wizard of Oz? And I was like, But okay, fair enough. Phineas and Ferb episode of The Wizard of Oz. Let's cover this really quickly. Okay, so Candace, um, I'm going to assume you know the basic plot of Phineas and Ferb because that's what's going on, uh, just with Wizard of Oz tacked on over it. Candace is bored one day. Her mother gives her the Wizard of Oz to read. She idly pages through it. Meanwhile, her brothers are doing one of their invention thingies and decide to wash the house. So they put the house up on a uh, one of those poles like at the um, car place, I guess, and uh, spin it around while washing it off with a hose. Candace does not know what's going on. She's got uh, the book on the brain, so she thinks it's a tornado. She gets dizzy and passes out and has a dream where she has gone to the land of odds. Isabella is uh, the good witch who rides around in an eyeball bubble. Candace's house has landed on the witch uh, who keeps complaining that uh, she's still alive and nobody will get the house off of her. She has red 
red boots, which are given to Candace, and Candace is told to take the yellow sidewalk to Bustopolis so that she can find her heart's desire, which is busting her brothers, of course. Her brothers keep popping in along the way, saying, hey, we've got a much easier road for you to take, if, and it's a lot more fun, but of course, Candace doesn't want to do anything that her brothers have come up with. So she meets up with Rajit, who is a scarecrow, with Buford, who is a uh, lion slash tiger slash bear beastie thing, and with Jeremy, who is a tree. They all want various things, except Buford, who actually wants nothing. Uh, but it's an excuse for a lot of songs and a lot of goofiness. They encounter Doofenshmirtz, who is not a witch, he is a warlock. It's not a dress, it's a robe, etc., etc. They follow the basic tenets, and um, finally, Candace gets to Bustopolis, encounters the wizard, who is her mother, and has the opportunity to bust her brothers, but her mother says whatever her brothers did sounds like a lot of fun, and it's not really a big deal. Then Candace wakes up and gets back to the real world. Okay, so that's that one done. Two thousand fifteen, the Lost in Oz series. Okay, full disclosure: this one is two seasons long, and um, there are a lot of episodes, so I didn't watch the whole thing. I just watched uh, most of the first episode, and it, it, it was really hard for me to follow. So, if any, again, if anybody has seen this and wants to fill in more details in the comments, please do. In this one, modern-day girl Dorothy Gale, who is a Rube Goldberg-style inventor, finds a magic book beneath her floorboards, which directs her to say the words, Go Forth, aloud. When she does, a magic green tornado spins the house about. She calls her mom, who somehow knows what's going on, and tells her to find the map in the book, and that the tornado will take her to Oz. She will then need to find her way home from there. The mom uses a crystal ball in the garage to call someone for help. Meanwhile, the tornado sets the house down in Oz, right by the Emerald City. The cops there question her, wanting to know where she got magic from. She displays the journal, which is not an unknown quantity to them, and she obtains a visitor's pass. The map directs her to the subway station and the yellow brick line. She meets another young woman named West, who turns green when she gets angry, who says their moms know each other, and a young man named Ojo, who is a munchkin boy, hmm... All magic there runs off a periodic table, some of which you're born with, some of which you have to develop from elements. She also meets a patchwork lad, who has a Scottish accent, who is running from flying monkeys, and who asks for her help in return for assisting her to find the missing magic she needs to get home. They get a box containing a grain of ozonium, which they test on the toy, bringing it to life, and the monkeys carry away West and the box. The patchwork lad was going to use the ozonium to bring the lookout to life which is a large statue overlooking the city. It was a real guardian turned to stone years ago. And unfortunately, this is all I got because I was completely lost by this point. I am so sorry. And last but not least, Emerald City, circa 2015, if my sources are correct. This is a series of about 10 episodes. And again, full disclosure, I did not watch the whole thing. Um, as of this video's uh, release, it is only available on Prime to purchase. And I, I just couldn't justify the expense, especially not having seen it. So I bought the first episode and that was all I watched. The entire series is $25 and that was just a little steep for me. One episode was $3. Uh, in this one, Dorothy is a grown girl. Again, she lives in the tiny town of Lucas, Kansas. There's about 300 people there. Dorothy works in the local hospital, which seems pretty sizable. So I'm wondering if Lucas is also the name of the county, because it seems odd that such a small town would have its own hospital. Dorothy was dropped off uh, with her aunt and uncle. She was dropped off at the farmhouse by her mother, who sought shelter in a storm. We see that in a very brief flashback at the beginning. Now, her mother still lives in the area, but Dorothy is estranged from her. 
her aunt convinces her it's Dorothy's birthday and she says, why don't you go talk to your mom? So Dorothy goes down to her trailer uh, as a storm brews. She doesn't find her there. She looks in the adjoining storm cellar and finds her mom there apparently having been attacked and bleeding out. She wants to help her, but her mom says, no, go save yourself. And as the storm is coming, like the cyclone is literally coming down the road, um, Dorothy has gone out into the road to try and find help. A policeman has come, but he gets picked up by the cyclone and Dorothy dives into his car as last minute shelter. The tornado, of course, spirits her to Oz, and as it turns out, the dog that was in the back seat, a police German Shepherd doggy. She wakes up to find herself in a dense forest, and she has hit someone with the car, who is apparently dead. The indigenous denizens of the forest, a tribe of sorts, um, seem like some sort of Viking tribe, uh, accuse her of witchcraft and of having killed the witch who um, is a big deal over there, and they're not too happy with her. They kind of put her on trial, and they finally decide to lead her to the road, which will take her away from their lands. The main guy there, his name is Ojo, so we have Ojo again, um, but he is not too friendly and doesn't particularly like her, although he does give her a decent amount of backstory. We also meet Oz, who's Vincent D'Onofrio in this, and uh, apparently there was a lot of fuss and bother, big battles, big um, monsters and whatnot attacking the country, and he supposedly used his magic to protect everyone. You can see vestiges of the battle, um, giant statues of people turned to stone and bones from monsters and whatnot. Dorothy can see all this as she walks along. She is brought to the road, which is the yellow brick road, but it is brick, and it is lined with yellow pollen. We also meet the Witch of the West, uh, who doesn't really do magic anymore. Instead, she runs a bordello. Have I mentioned that many of these are not your mama's Wizard of Oz? There's a lot of, uh, like, in-politicking and intrigue and whatnot going on with the witch and the wizard and the other witch and etc. Dorothy travels along the road and uh, encounters a man who has been strung up on, um, I don't know, what do you call this, uh, basically, like, crucified, more or less. Um, and he has lost part of his memory. She gets him down and helps him to you know, feel better and they travel along the road. Uh, before you know it, they are brought down by the witch's magic, the witch of the east, who has survived and gone after them for revenge. She goes through Dorothy's bag. Dorothy has uh, taken some stuff from the police car for her safety, and in there is a gun. Dorothy tricks her into setting the gun off, and that supposedly, finally dispatches the Witch of the East. This was the end of the episode, so that's all I got to watch. I will say that perhaps this may be worth the $25 because it has a budget. It is very good, <laughs> at least thus far. Um, like I say, it's, it's actually got people who you may recognize. It has Vincent D'Onofrio. It has Florence... Kasumba? I don't know how to pronounce her name. She briefly showed up in the Marvel movies. It also has Gina Bellman as Dorothy's mom. Fans of Coupling and Leverage will remember Gina Bellman, so that was a real treat to see her. So yes, I kind of wish I had watched the whole thing, but I ran out of time. <laughs> and again, the price was a little steep. If you have seen it, let me know. This is the last Oz entry on my list. One last thing, because, again, I'm almost done with this video, and my helpful children are like, aren't you going to rank them? I said, well, I hadn't planned on it, because I just don't see who... Does anybody really care about my opinion? But they're like, oh, no, you have to rank them. It's a YouTube thing. Everybody does it. So, okay, fine. Everybody does it. All right. And let's just give in to peer pressure. So, my rankings of all these are as follows. Starting from the bottom, number 19, Veggie Tales Wizard of Haas. I'm sorry, it just, <laughs> it wasn't for me. Maybe if I'd watched it as a kid and had nostalgia, but as a grown-up, it just did not 
take. Number 18, The Wizard of Mars. It had a couple of interesting ideas, but overall the movie is very long and very boring. It just, it, there's a lot that's bad about it, sadly. Number 17 is going to be the 1925 version due to uh, extreme overt racism. I just couldn't get past it. Number 16 is the Lost in Oz series. Now, maybe, it, you know, I'll give it the benefit of the doubt. Maybe if I had watched more, I would have gotten into it and really liked it. But just going off the strength of the first episode, there was just too much going on. I could not follow it, and I could not get into it, unfortunately. Number 15 is Galaxy of Oz from 1992 for much the same reason. Again, if I had watched the uh, the series version, maybe I could have understood what was going on more. But watching the movie version, oh my gosh, it was just way too confusing. Number 14 is the 1933 cartoon, and that's just because it's really not so very Wizard of Ozzy. It's so short and uh, just the cute little... 1930s quick cartoon, um, so I'm just going off of that. Number 13 is the 1910 version. There were some neat things about it, but overall it really doesn't bear much resemblance to The Wizard of Oz that we know. Number 12 is 20th Century Oz. This also suffered from being over long, and there were other parts of it uh, that just didn't take the, um, especially that concert. Whew, that is a weird concert sequence. You have to see it. Wow. Um, still, you know, I don't mind a good, bad movie, and there were parts that were enjoyable, so I'll give it that. Same with number 11, which is that 1971 Turkish version. Uh, there were just parts that were so silly, it was enjoyable. And I did like that they included the China Village, even though it came across very weird and kind of nightmare fuely. But still, you know, credit where credit's due. Number 10 is the 1987 animated version, and that's mainly because it was a bit long, um, and it didn't change much from the 1982 version, really. They were fairly similar. Uh, 1982 is my number 9. I just didn't feel that they had much that was different to offer. I do like a good direct adaption, but, you know, I like seeing little imagination too. What can you bring to the table? Eight will be that 1988 Polish version uh, with the stop motion and animation combined. And that's because I really liked the art. The art style was very different. Um, again, kind of nightmare inducing, but hey, you know, it was different. And um, the, the music was fairly catchy, even if repetitive. Um, and they had some interesting ideas. Number seven is The Wiz. I really enjoyed it. Um, the main thing about it was, again, it was overlong, and not all the songs were that great, but I really liked the ideas in it. Number six is Tin Man. Uh, I enjoyed this one, um, even as a miniseries, though it's a bit long. And <laughs> obviously my recap was way too long. I'm sorry about that. Um, but yeah, they had some different ideas, but overall, I think the ideas were a little too different. I liked a lot of the elements to it, very steampunky uh, wardrobe and technology ideas, so that was cool. But overall, not much to move it further up the list. Number five is Tom and Jerry, just because it's an enjoyable little cartoon. I'm actually not much on Tom and Jerry. I'm more a Looney Tunes gal, but they had a lot of fun with it. Um... Again, there wasn't much that was too different because they were basically retelling the 39 version, so uh, they're not further up there. Number four is the Muppets version. I really enjoyed that one. Um, Ashanti is not much of an actress, but uh, still she did a serviceable job, and uh, there, there were a couple parts that were maybe a little grown up. I saw online where some people were complaining about it, but it does happen sometimes with Muppet movies. Um, but yes, overall, I very much enjoyed that one. Number three will be the Phineas and Ferb episode because it's Phineas and Ferb and I like Phineas and Ferb, so there. 
Number two is Emerald City. I only watched one episode, but I really enjoyed it. It had a budget. It had good acting. It had good, um, you know, effects, costumes, uh, locations, sets. Everything about it was pretty damn good. And they had enough that was the same that made you go, ah. And they had enough that was different that made you want to see where they were going with it. And number one, I mean, of course, I had to put the 39 classic as number one because it's just, it's, it's good enough that you can watch it repeatedly and not get tired of it. That's what makes it a classic. If it wasn't for that one, I would have put the Emerald City first, obviously. But yes, those are my required YouTube rankings. Thank you very much. Well, there you have it. Every version of The Wizard of Oz, at least on film or television. I'm sure there are book adaptions. I did not get to those. Oh my gosh, I have failed you all. I'm so sorry. <laughs> However, just watching all these has taken me months, so I, I hope you will consider that to be enough dedication, at least at this point in time. Um, do let me know if you've seen any of these adaptions or you know, if any of them sound intriguing. If you have read any, if there are any I missed somehow, uh, do fill me in and give me suggestions for uh, another series like this. Um, it was a lot of work, but it was kind of exciting and uh, I, I had fun. I hope you did too. So until next week, Take care of yourselves and each other sincerely. And remember, there's no place like home. Bye.